Good morning. It's Tom Padula from Tom Padula TV on YouTube and Insania Booksellers. And uh, this morning, uh, I'm actually starting right on time at 11.25 and we'll go till 12.30 or thereabouts, um, give or take a minute or two. Uh, it, today is uh, the, 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 the uh, well, what day is it? The 4th of August, 2022. And uh, this is... Uh, lesson presentation number uh, 42, program 42, podcast 42 of the series of World History by Tom Padula live on Facebook. And welcome to Curtis L. Torman. Uh, really great that you've come in right on time. Now, this morning, uh, I was just thinking just a minute ago, you know, how happy really I am to be doing this world history uh, because it's opened up... Um, a whole new world for me, <laughs> literally. Uh, and it can do the same for you too, because um, by studying history, we learn about our humanity and we also learn about um, about how to treat, uh, you know, the, the areas that we live in. Because one of the things that we don't tend to do is actually study the physical geography of continents and countries, you know, not many people would know all the rivers of Australia. And not many people would know the major rivers of uh, the United States or, you know, the uh, the North American continent. And the same with Africa and the same with uh, Asia, Europe. Uh, you know, wherever we go in the world, there's a lot, a lot of uh, knowledge relating to the actual, the, the use of... Um, of the areas in which people live. Now, North America, of course, uh, you know, people say, oh, Christopher Columbus. Now, we've gone over that. You know, Christopher Columbus did discover America for the Spaniards. And the idea was to exploit uh, the locals and uh, the, the areas uh, for, you know, in the, for conquest. Because when people fought in the past, uh, and they overcame other people. Ba basically, they destroyed their the villages, etc. But they also took the people, uh, the women and the children, as slaves. Uh, so they were regarded as, uh, as spoils of war. So humanity uh, has been pretty cruel towards itself. Because if you consider that everyone is part of... Um, humanity, regardless of uh, colour, race, etc. If we are all in this together, then why do we do this to ourselves? Something you should think about. And the other thing too, I, I think about it, the other thing too, of course, we're very lucky today that we can have books and uh, we can have uh, the online, you know, the technology that allows us not just to communicate with each other, but now to also, to also express our own opinions. And of course, our opinions don't really count for much unless they are part of a bigger, uh, a bigger number of people who think the same. Now, welcome to Tony Angelino. Uh, so history, the past, is what makes us who we are today. But it also gives us, it's a push to say, what do we do for our future? Do we want the wars? Do, do we want to work so hard to make buildings and roads, etc., and then someone just with a bomb, boom, and destroys it all? 20 years of work, 50 years of work, hundreds of, of years of you know, history destroyed. Uh, and the problem in today's world is that all this power that we have can, in fact, destroy our world as it makes it better too. We can do both, the, the good and the evil, sort of, they, 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 they sort of live together. And uh, that's where we are. So my work, if you like, is in order for us to be more understanding uh, of 
who we are, what we are, what we should do, what we shouldn't do, uh, with sort of um, a step into history. At the moment, I'm, I've been watching the Vikings. I finished the the series of the Vikings on on Netflix, and I'm watching the Last Kingdom. Apparently, the two of them, the two series, are, are related. They relate to the the Vikings, the the Vikings history, uh, until of course they became part of um, you know what we now know as England and also Ireland and Belgium, you know, the northern areas, Norway. So that's that's the northern part of Europe. And the Rus, they used to call them the Vikings of Russia, you know, the northern part. They're really tough individuals who live in very cold countries and involved in very old uh, very, uh, and areas that um, uh, we would consider inevitable. So that's where we are now. I'll continue from last week, from uh, uh, where we were. We talked about um, we talked about uh, the paper. You know the the idea that um, you know the early part of uh, of the Dark Ages, uh, where there was a lot of destruction, and really the one the people who actually kept uh, the, the people who actually kept the whole thing together in from the point of view of knowledge, were the, the monks. The monks, when Rome, the, you know, the Western Roman Empire fell to the barbarians, what they used to call the barbarians, and the barbarians became then Roman citizens, and you know, they took over, they, they adopted a lot of the culture uh, of the Romans because the Romans had established a language, Latin, right across the empire. And so the minor languages sort of, you know, you spoke the minor languages, but if you wanted to get on with things, you had to learn Latin. So when the barbarians, then you know, the the northern, the Norsemen, the, the tribal from the north, uh, they were interested in, you know, picking up whatever they could, wherever they, wherever they could, because they came from lands that were inhospitable. So the barbarism, if you like, is understandable, in my opinion. Okay, let's go. Now we're talking about Charlemagne protects the Pope from the Lombards. Charlemagne was uh, a great king of of the Franks, or, or, of of modern day France, from the Gauls. So the Franks. So Charlemagne, we, we can hear a lot about him. If I ever do something on the great peoples of history, Charlemagne uh, writes as a top one. Only once during the Dark Ages was most of Western Europe united under, again, under one government as it had been in the days of the Romans. In 773 AD, that's uh, after Dominus, you know, the, after the, the, the birth of Christ. I'm not sure whether the, you know, the, I think the calendar starts from his birth, the, the year of his birth, rather than the year of his death. Uh, in 7th century, the Pope was threatened by the Lombards, another northern, you know, sort of tribe. A barbarian people who had seized the north of Italy. He appealed for help to Charlemagne, Charles the Great in, in English, king of the Franks who exiled the Lombard king and gave the Pope much land in central Italy. So he went in there and, uh, you know, did away with the, some of the Lombards at the top. But, you know, one of the regions of Italy now is called Lombardia. Uh, that's, uh, that's wonderful that the Lombards uh, were an actual people, a tribe. Like in Lucani, where I come from, in Basilicata, in Italy, the, the old tribe was called Lucani. So the, the people who live in Basilicata are called now Lucani, uh, the old tribe. It's interesting. He then attacked the heathen Saxons who lived in the forests of central Germany and the Avars, a Mongoloid people related to the Huns. So he was quite a, a strong leader, uh, Charlemagne. And he also was responsible for stopping the, the, the Arab uh, movement, you know, the Muslim movement into, uh, they had conquered the uh, Spain, but they were stopped by the Franks at the Pyrenees. 
That's why I said, you know, the geographical aspects of the world, we should know pretty well. We should know, you know, the, uh, the features, the main features, the mountains, lakes, rivers, things like that. Now, Charlemagne conquers the Saxons and the Avars. You know, Avatars? <laughs> Avars. See, some of these names come up in modern-day uh, media. Welcome to Christian Burguero. Good to see you. Uh, in this and other wars, Charlemagne was so successful that he made himself ruler of most of Western and Central Europe. So rather than a king, he became an emperor. An emperor is above the kings. He controls many kings because you can't be everywhere. But if you are very good uh, in the use of your bureaucracy and the, the, arm, the army under your command, then, uh, you know, uh, in, in those times, they became emperors and there were emperors in China. And Charlemagne was an emperor in the western part of Europe. As he gave to conquered heathens like the Saxons the choice of conversion to Christianity or death. Uh, what's new, Pussycat? Huh? The, the Christians who, whose leader died on a cross, you know, then become part of government, and if you don't become a Christian, you would go and meet your maker, whoever that may be, uh, somewhere else. So, the, so the, most of Europe then became uh, under, the Franks became Christians. Uh, the number of Christians in Europe increased rapidly, and the Pope had another reason for being grateful to his champion. So in other words... Um, in other words, the Pope then, from then on, acquired greater power even above the Emperor. And in fact, 300 years later, uh, one of the Popes got um, one of the uh, King, the Emperors, to actually wait outside in Rome because they had, had difficulties with each other for three days before he saw him in the snow. <laughs> that's the, the myth or, you know, that's what happens. At the time, you know what what you read you now, whether it's true or not, it doesn't matter. the The idea is to show that the Pope had greater power, both spiritually and uh, uh, also uh, in terms of the temporal power, the political power uh, over all subjects in Europe, regardless of who the king was. And uh, therefore, the Pope decided, Charlemagne, thank you very much. We're going to crown you emperor, Roman emperor. Uh, men began to say that he was a new Caesar, chosen by God to bring peace and order again into the world. On Christmas Day in the year 800, in the great church of St. Peter's at Rome, the Pope crowned him emperor of the Romans. Charlemagne goes from, you know, France comes down to Rome. They didn't have cars or whatever. They had roads. But, you know, it was all done, uh, you know, took time to get things done. But they did. Charlemagne rules wisely and encourages learning. That's one good thing. And did you know that Charlemagne did not know how to read or write himself? From his capital, Ete, or Aiken, Aiken, welcome to Asunda Lombardia. Near the present border of France and Germany, Charlemagne ruled his dominions firmly and wisely. So he brought order into his kingdom, into his kingdoms. Though he himself could scarcely write, he did all he could to encourage education. He appointed a very learned English monk called Arquin to found a palace school in which the emperor himself was sometimes a pupil. Many historians think that by such actions as this Charlemagne did more to earn his title of the great than by all his successful wars. As a rule, only a really great man is wise, wise enough to realise the value of something he himself has been able to do very well without. To actually recognise the, the power of education and what it does to people. So it, it's, um, it lifts them. 
it lifts everyone. And the more education you have, but education can also be like um, a little prison, you know, sort of, uh, it's not always, it, it's got to be used wisely because it can also be misused. And that's another one. And one of the things that I do, that I encourage these days, you know, getting older now, so I can save things just in case, uh, I think all governments, all governments should take up education uh, and make it in forefront in their government for adults. So you would send kids to school to learn up to a certain age and then they go out. Then we got to work and, in, and education for adults should be free in all subject areas at the beginning level. You give them one year. Say so the beginning of anything, whatever you want to do, whatever you want to learn, the first year in TAFE system should be free. No charge. Anyone can go in and out of these educational areas. The, our libraries are doing a great job now because that's they've moved from books into technology as well and also workshops and everything else and people meet there. So that is a, a very strong civilizing factor for our uh, communities, very important. So education for adults through TAFE and even in uh, libraries, you can have classes, why not? Just a few, you don't need many, but what I'm saying is if you want to do, you, and I think uh, uh, teachers can do it voluntarily. At the moment, I'm at the University of the Third Age teaching French, and I do online with Spanish as well. Uh, free. I don't get paid for that. And it's the re reason, and I asked somebody, I said, well, well, I think teachers should be paid. And the guy says, no, but you lose something when you, uh, when you pay. But, you know, if you want the good ones, uh, you know, it, it gets institutionalised. So at the beginning, everyone is nice about, about things, voluntary here, voluntary there, but then that voluntarism can be exploited. So I, I don't know what the answer is. Anyway, Charlemagne's empire breaks up at his death. Unfortunately, when the great Charles died, much of his good work was undone. His empire fell apart almost at once, though the title of Holy Roman Emperor, Emperor was later taken by the most powerful of the many German kings. His sons and grandsons fought amongst themselves. And, you know, one of the great ones was Frederick II, you know, German. Each of them demanding a larger share of territory. In addition, a new series of barbarian invasions began about this time and continued for about 200 years. So we got to the year 1000, the Danish invasions. We shall learn more about these new raiders who were called variously Vikings, Northmen or Danes later in the chapter, you know, whatever we're doing here. So these are the, uh, I'll show you the picture here uh, about the northern the northerners here have a look at that see that the movement in the north Jutes, angles saxons Brittany, you know sorry uh, saxons angles that's where english comes from the irish the celts the scots the picts further north from the scots and then Brittany, and Brittany is actually uh, not in England, it's actually in France. So Great Britain, uh, when the Brittany people conquered parts of England, England, the Saxons, you know, etc., etc. All right? So here we go. So well, that's it. That's for this week from, you know, uh, the next week we'll do the English invasion of Britain. But we're talking about the year... Uh, those years after Charlemagne. So, <laughs> you know how it is. Uh, we continue uh, with all this. Anyway, the next thing is we shift. We shift from uh, Europe and we go to China now. China is another big one, a big study. 
especially now. You know, Chinese are on the media all the time. Let's learn about China and um, the, the great civilization that they had until uh, sort of the, in the 19th and the 20th century, they sort of uh, had uh, problems. But before that, they were a very strong, uh, a very strong uh, nation. And they had their own problems too, don't worry. Zhang Qian's mission to the Western regions. Okay. With the jingle of the camel bell in the Han dynasty, China established contact with other nations outside in the Western region. So they were near the, the sea. Then if they go in towards Europe, there's more land and the desert and the mountains. So, but slowly they sort of moved towards there conquering more lands toward the West. Since then, Chinese and foreign cultures have clashed and mixed. In the time of Emperor Wudi, the Huns in the north often harassed the boundary of Han. Meanwhile, they also controlled several small nations in the Western region. In 138 BC, okay, Emperor Wudi sent Zhang Qiang, with a delegation of over 100 people on a diplomatic mission to the West regions to seek allies, preparing for an attack of the Huns in two sides. Unexpectedly, Zhang Qiang was captured by the Huns just as he left the Han territory and was held prisoner for a dozen years. During this period, he learned the Han language and got to know well the geography of their territory. Ten years later, Zhang Qiang escaped and found the West found the West moved escaped and found the West moved Da Yue Zi. He found Da Da Yue Zi. He lived there for a year and got familiar with the circumstance of the Western regions. Later, when he learned that Da Wezi had no intention to seek revenge, Zhang Qian made his way to Chang'an with only one companion left of the 100 who had set out. Well, in 119 BC, Emperor Wudi sent Zhang Qian on a second diplomatic mission to the Western regions. This time he had an entourage of 300 with thousands of head of cattle and sheep and a large amount of gifts. They visited many countries and these countries sent envoys with tribute to the Han court because they gave them sheep and like, cattle, etc. From then on, the Han dynasty had frequent contacts with the countries in the western regions, later setting up a western region frontier command in today's Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region. Uh, you know what the current government is doing in the Uyghur, in the Uyghur's regions? They sort of have isolated them, like in prison camps. But if you ask the Chinese, no, no, that's not true. We're just educating them. That's fair enough. You, they they got a big heart. They want to educate people don't want to be educated. So there you are. Uyghur Autonomous Region, which was under the administration of the central government. The Silk Road was another outcome of Zhang Qian's journeys. So this Zhang Qian was quite a, a diplomat. He, you know, he, he was captured by the enemy, if you like. He lived with the enemy and then he became their friend with the central government. Very convenient. The Silk Road started from Chang'an in the east and stretched westwards to reach the eastern shores of the Mediterranean Sea and the Roman Empire. So the Silk Road allowed for trade and became a famous uh, road and still is. And in fact, uh, I saw not so long ago, a train goes from China to Spain in a direct line and they exchange goods through that train. Find out. Trade caravans from China carrying large amounts of silk fabrics exchange merchandise with traders from Persia, India and Rome. 
and brought home walnuts, grapes and carrots from abroad. Don't forget that the Chinese were famous for the silk and the silkworm, they kept the way they sort of grew it, etc. Uh, they kept it a secret for th a thousand years plus. They were the only ones who could make silk. Smart. In the following several centuries, Sino Western exchanges, mainly characterised by the silk trade, were mostly carried through the Silk Road. And now we have the same thing called technology. The Americans had it, the Chinese learned from it, and now they're going to surpass them because they've got 1.4 billion people. 1.3, 1.4. America's only got under 400, 400 million. So, you know, you can understand that when uh, there is unity in a country as big as China is, and it's a, it becomes very, very strong, you can do almost anything. But you have to live, you have to live, uh, you know, uh, through it. The Maritime Silk Road, there's a note here. There was also a Silk Road on the sea during the Han Dynasty. It started from coastal ports in today's Guangdong province and ended in India by way of Thailand after 10 months voyage. The Han merchants took with them silk and gold and exchanged them for sapphires. In the Eastern Han Dynasty, Chinese sailing ships reached as far as Africa and established trade contact with the Empire of Rome. Now, what they didn't mention here, that during the Han Dynasty as well, they, uh, they also moved towards the south, towards Indonesia, and eventually the Chinese, some of the Chinese ships uh, arrived in, in northwestern Australia. But, as I say, these people came and went. The invasion occurs only when you stay there. So if we got to Mars and come back, we know what it's like, but we'll leave it alone. But if we're going to settle in there, then one becomes a Martian after a couple of generations. And so the Martians, if they happen to live there, what are they going to do with the people who come from outside? They look different from them. These are some of the problems you encounter when cultures clash. So that's Zhang Gang. Mission of the West. <laughs> As I said, I'm doing world history, so I'm looking into uh, into uh, the uh, you know the various continents. I want to bring them together. Global. Uh, you know, I was from Melbourne to Darwin was under three hours. I can't believe it. You know, almost three thousand kilometers, two thousand seven hundred and something. And I thought to myself, you know, really, if you had the money, the willingness, the youth, the enthusiasm, all those things there, you can visit. And some people do. They visit all over the world. There was a lady, 94 years old, who had been everywhere for the last 30 years. So from the mid-60s, 94. Can you imagine? Unbelievable what you can do. Settlement of the Americas. Now... With America, I thought, I thought we're going to look at it first before I start. Because, here we go. The use of technology. Look at this. Huh? See that? Now, the Vikings apparently came through here. Greenland, via Greenland. They reached Greenland and then they moved through these islands in the north. So, And that occurred, all this was all together before, before the Ice Age melted and created these, uh, the seas here, which a lot of it is ice. I haven't been there, so forgive me, you, you can find out. So... This is where we are. So Christopher Columbus did discover America for uh, the Spaniards, but, uh, but the Paleo Indians were there from 14,000, 16,000 years ago. So there you are. Look how many, you know, look, 
these are the big lakes. The lakes are there between the United States and Canada. There are lakes everywhere. Look at that, how much water there is. But if you come down then to California here, there's less. A Rio Grande, the big river. But some of it, it's quite dry, like in Australia. So, but we're talking about, you know, we got here, we got here Central America. So, you know, the quite equatorial tropical zones. So that's it for now. And I'm going to, uh, you know, it's not just when you read and people have done things. Uh, of course, I can't, you know, I, I look it up. And that's what you can do too. Conventional estimates have it that humans reached North America at some point between 15,000 and 20,000 years ago. The traditional theory is that these early migrants moved when sea levels were significantly lowered due to, to the, and they give it a name, quaternary glaciation. Following herds of now extinct Pleistocene megafauna, the big animals, the megafauna, because people followed the the animals uh, because they you know they they lived off them uh, because the animals before that you know humans were uh, were feeding the animals and then when humans became smart <laughs> they started eating them like I went to the northern part two weeks ago for the first time in my life uh, I had a, a crocodile sandwich in crocodile country. And I also saw the guy in the, in the boat sort of hanging out some meat to attract the crocodile for the tourists on the boat. And they made a big fuss. Don't worry, you know, because crocodiles just want to eat. Doesn't matter what's, and, you know, we are pretty good. Uh, if we can eat them, they can eat us. But then I worked it out, who should be scared, the crocodile or the human? And then the guy says, there are so many thousands of crocodiles, but only a few people get killed. But when now we farm them. <laughs> so the crocodiles are scared of humans. But I wouldn't like to meet a crocodile, you know, <laughs> face to face, even though I think I'm superior. <laughs> All right, that, that's it. So... Now, this quaternary glaciation, following herds of now extinct Pleistocene megafauna along ice-free corridors that stretched between the Laurentide and Cordilleran ice sheets. Now, these are all technical terms. Who knows them? The main thing is to remember that they were like bridges. You could go from... Another route proposed is that either on foot or using primitive boats, they migrated down the Pacific coast to South America as far as Chile. Any archaeological evidence of a coastal occupation during the last ice age would now have been covered by the sea level rise up to 100 metres since then. 100 metres down. That 100 metres down was once Earth. Can you imagine that? The Clovis first theory refers to the 1950s hypothesis that the Clovis culture represents the earliest human presence in the Americas, uh, beginning about 13,000 years ago. However, evidence of pre-Clovis cultures has accumulated since the year 2000, the last 20 years, pushing back the possible date of the first peopling of the Americas, Possibly find, finds indicate that the human arrival in the Americas occurred prior to the last glacial maximum. More recently, in September 2021, scientists reported the discovery of human footprints in White Sands National Park in the U.S. state of New Mexico that have a, a calibrated date range of 22,860 to 21,130 years old around the time of the last glacial maximum and possibly the oldest record of humans in the Americas. So up to 21, 22,000 years ago, they've got some evidence there of the peopling of the Americas. Now I took, you know, of course, thank you, Wikipedia. Thank you to 
all the people on the net to put the information up. What do you want me to do? I can't check it all out. I pick out bit, bits and pieces here and there because education is about learning from other people. That's why, you know, when you use something like this, copyright, this and that, mavala, you're going to die one day. You might as well share the information as much as possible. You can only have, you know, feed yourself with one stomach. You don't need a lot more. So there you are. So that's the settlement of America. And of course, we can't neglect our indigenous people, can we? Isn't it funny? Since last year, I've been doing the indigenous cultures. And then finally, maybe somebody rewarded me, said, you go to the Northern Territory, have a look for yourself. The reality is that, um, I mentioned this before, when I was in Bangal Bangal in the northern part, in a little plain with five people in it, uh, the terrain is pretty, you know, you can't do much with it, really. You can live within it, the villages, etc., but, you know, you've got a dry season and you've got a wet season where a lot of the, a lot of the land gets covered with water up to four, five, six, seven metres high, even more. Uh, therefore, you know, it's sort of, it's hard. And it'll be hard for our governments, whichever colour the government is, to actually be able to bring all the latest uh, into those areas. That's why we have the big cities. The smaller areas, the smaller populated areas can't do much. You need the, uh, you know, the, you need the big populations to be able to do big things. So here we are. Now, last week we did the women, the chapter I'm doing now is women and men. Women and men. Okay. And uh, we talked about women last week. So you can look it up last week live, or you can go to blogspot, tompadula.blogspot.com in the presentations or lessons. And then you can also go now on YouTube. But on YouTube, I've only got the four hours that I do, the first 10 programs of each one. And every couple of weeks, I'll try to put in another five until I catch up, because it takes a lot of work to do that and also expense, but I'm happy to do it. Uh, this time here, we're going to talk about, see what happens with uh, women and men. In, mo in most Aboriginal groups, where women were kept out of many of the men's ceremonies, but women had their own ceremonies and rituals, which were secret to, the, to them, and no man could attend. These were about puberty, childbirth and marriage and to maintain the physical and social health of the community. In all parts of Australia, girls were promised as wives when they were very small children, or even before they were born. So if I have a child, will you give me that girl, you know, like, can I marry her? That's the sort of thing that they had. You can imagine the controls. That's why uh, Indigenous people in Australia never had more than a million people in the whole of Australia, in their history, and not populated at all. Uh, it says something. And let's say when they accuse others of cruelty, which is true, uh, when people arrived here, they fought with each other, they did all sorts of things. What one has to remember, for example, we celebrate Australia Day on the 26th of January because that sort of recognises when uh, when the ship arrives, the colonials arrived. Now, if we get rid of that, let's say, we forget about that date, you will not remember the suffering that the Indigenous people went through. So in other words, on one hand, it's a celebration. On the other hand, it's a reminder of what humans can do to each other. And then the religion part comes in, the forgiveness. 
comes in, forgive each other and move forward together, one family. That's where the government is at now. But they've got a big battle because a lot of the population doesn't necessarily believe that. So, you, you know, you have to now go to, you've got to go through the motions of, uh, of educating people to say, come on, let's be one. And those places where we cannot improve, uh, it's important that we do for ourselves and for them, for everybody. Uh, and so that's it. Let's go on. In all parts of Australia, girls were promised as wives when they were small, children, or even before they were born. Sometimes there was a man anxiously waiting to see if his mother-in-law would produce a daughter for him. He then had some years to wait. The age at which a girl went to live with her husband varied. Tiwi girls in the northern, in the north, and Walpiri, Wal, or Walpiri, girls in the central Australia, went to the, their husbands when they were nine or ten years old. But in other areas, the western desert, for example, they stayed with their parents until they were about fifteen. The husband might take his young wife far away to live near his parents, but it was quite common for the couple to stay for some years near her parents. The man could then hunt and bring home meat to his parents-in-law, as his father-in-law might be getting quite old by now. Also, when the wife had their first baby, she would be in a place she knew with her mother near her. And we still do that today, you know particular ethnic groups, the, 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 the girls, the, the wives are very close to their, their own mother and usually they have conflicts with their mother-in-law because their mother-in-law wants to control, maybe. But there are exceptions to the rule. It's not the same all the time. Now, the Central and Western Desert women performed a secret ceremony for the birth of each baby while the mother and baby were hidden in the bush. They gathered round her and painted their own bodies and those of the mother and baby in colours and of red, white and black. The singing and dancing both celebrated the birth and assured the health of mother and baby. After that, the mother could take part in women's ceremonies, which before had been forbidden to her. So once she becomes a mother... If a young woman had borne no, no children after some years of marriage, some of the most senior women took her away from the camp and performed a very powerful ceremony over her. If she still had no children after that, she might be given a child to adopt by the mother of several children and so have the status of mother. So if you can't do them, you can't make them yourself, get someone else's, which is a good idea. At least, you know, a child is loved and looked after. As a woman grew older and had a number of children, she became more important in the woman's secret life. She had the right to reorganise some of the women's ceremonies, perhaps one of the, those used to cure sickness, to mend a break in marriage, or to get a new husband for another woman. I think I'm going to stop there. Okay? Well, and so that's it for women in Australia. Now, I've got... Uh, that's, that's done as well. Now we go to our Banja. Banja Patterson. And, uh, you know, the, the colonials. We've got to do some of the literature. Why not? And they're also painters, sculptors, all sorts of people with great talent. And also they establish an established industry for the arts. And that's uh, another contribution by, uh, by the colonials to the indigenous people. All these, uh, you know, possibilities in fashion, in the arts, uh, where uh, cultures are appreciated in the theatre, in film, you name it. It doesn't look like, you know, sort of... Um, Important, but they are important industries. In defence of the bush, 
So you're back from up the country, Mr. Lawson, where you went, and you're cursing all the business in a bitter discontent. Well, we grieve to disappoint you, and it makes us sad to hear that it wasn't cool and shady and there wasn't plenty of beer. <laughs> and the loomy bullock snorted when you first came into view. Well, you know, it's not so often that he sees a swell like you. And the roads were hot and dusty, and the plains were burnt and brown, and no doubt you're better suited to drinking lemon squash in town. There you are, in defence of the bush. Yet perchance, if you should journey down the very track you went, in a month or two at furthest, you would wonder what it meant where the sun-baked earth was gasping like a creature in its pain. You would find the grasses waving like a field of summer grain and the miles of thirsty gutters blocked with sand and choked with mud. You would find the mighty rivers with a turbid sweeping flood for the rain and drought and sunshine makes no changes in the street, in the sullen line of buildings and the ceaseless tramp of feet. But the bush hath moods and changes as the seasons rise and fall, and the men who know the bushland, they are loyal through it all. And a beautiful, huh? powerful guy. But you found the bush was dismal and a land of no delight. Did you chance to hear a chorus in the shearers' huts at night? Did they rise up, William Riley, by the camp's fire, cheery blaze? Did they rise him as we rose him in the good old droving days? And the women of the homesteads and the men you chanced to meet, were their faces so unsettled like the faces in the street? In the street, you know, everyone's going to work. Yeah. They were smiling in, in the bush. And they, and the shy selector children, were they better now or worse? Then the little city urchins who would greet you with a curse. Stuff you, you know. <laughs> Is not a, such a life much better than the squalid street and square where the fallen women flaunt it in the fierce electric glare, where the seamstress plies her sewing till her eyes are sore and red in a filthy, dirty attic toiling on for daily bread. Did you hear no sweeter voices in the music of the bush? Then the roar of trams and buses and the warp whoop of the bush. Did the magp magpies rouse you from slumber with their carol sweet and strange? Did you hear the silver chiming of the bell birds on the range? But perchance the wild bird's music by your senses was despised, for you say you'll stay in townships till the bush is civilised. Would you make it a tea garden and on a Sunday have a, a band where the blokes might take their donors with a public close at hand? You had better stick to Sydney and make merry with a push for the bush will never suit you and you'll never suit the bush. Uh, you never <laughs> for the bush will never suit you, that's me, and you'll never suit the bush, that's true too. Uh, what a guy, huh? Benjamin Patterson. Good read. As I said, selected poems from Benjamin Patterson. Go for it. Now, this other guy, another one, but he didn't write poetry, or probably did, but he liked the prose, and he, he became very well known for the prose. So we'll continue now from The Drover's Wife. Uh, quite, quite a long uh, short story, so I'll just read a bit of it. Okay, uh, just a page. It must be near one or two o'clock, the fire's burning low. Alligator lies with his head resting on his paws. Uh-uh, uh-uh. Oh, yes. On his paws. And watches the wall. He's not a very beautiful dog to look at, and the light shows numerous old wounds where the hair will not grow. He is afraid of nothing on the face of the earth or under it. He will tackle a bullock as readily as he will tackle a flea. He hates all other dogs except kangaroo dogs and has a marked dislike to friends or relations of the family. 
They seldom call, however. He sometimes makes friends with strangers. He hates snakes and has killed many, but he will be bitten some day and die. Most snake dogs end that way. Now and then the bushwoman lays down her work and watches and listens and thinks. She thinks of things in her own life, for there is little else to think about. The rain will make the grass grow, and this reminds her how she fought a bushfire once a while her husband was away. The grass was long and very dry, and the fire threatened to burn her out. She put on an old pair of her husband's trousers and beat out the flames with a green bough. Till great drops of sooty perspiration stood out on her forehead and ran in streaks down her blackened arms. The sight of his mother's in trousers greatly amused Tommy, who worked like a little hero by her side. But the terrified baby howled lustily for his mummy. The fire would have mastered her butt for four excited bushmen who arrived in the nick of time. It was a mix of fair all round. When she went to take up the baby, he screamed and struggled convulsively, thinking it was a black man, and alligator trusting more to the child seen than his own instinct. Charged furiously, and being old and slightly deaf, did not in his state excitement at first recognise his mistress's voice, but continued to hang onto the moleskin until choked off by Tommy with a saddle strap. The dog's sorrow for his blunder and his anxiety to let it be known that it was all a mistake was as evident as his ragged tail and 12-inch grin could make it. It was a glorious time for the boys, a day to look back and talk about and laugh over for many years. She thinks how she fought a flood during her husband's absence. She stood for hours in the drenching downpour and dug out an overflow gutter to save the dam across the creek, but she could not save it. There was things that a bushman, a bushwoman cannot do. Next morning, the dam was broken and their heart was nearly broken too. For she thought how her husband would feel when he came home and saw the result of years of labour swept away. She cried then. I'm going to stop there. So there she cried then. And that was our... uh, That was... um, There was Andrew Lawson. And now for my usual problems... Uh, what do I got here? Yes, 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 yes. No, I better do it again. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> I did uh, a club last week. Uh, so in a social club, but in March of uh, 6, 7, 2021, there was one in a break, uh, there was one by Roma Social Club, this one here, uh, Roma Social Club, I'm going to give it to you, here in Melbourne, there we are, that's Roma Social Club, okay, and that's Sam there, but uh, we're now going to go back, to me, and I will select some of, I'll see how we go. You know, we need to, uh, I'll just show you a couple of uh, these places. Here, I went with Angela there. Yes. And we got there to here. We got to, oh, on the way. This is Preston. Preston City Hall, here. There you are. See that? Preston City Hall. So there's some pictures there. And, you know, this is for our friends overseas. That's it. That's one of our town halls. Beautiful, isn't it? Great picture. And that's the way in front. I like doing this. That was one of the works on, on the wall. There it is. 
the Aboriginal flag is there. Huh? Good. There we are. That's the front part. And there's a bit of a sculptor there. Beautiful building. Darabin Civic Centre. And it's with Angela. I took a couple of selfies there. And there's the trees, of course. There we are. This stone was laid by William Patterson, 1893. That's when it was. Look at that. Huh? The colonials. Let's not forget that was uh, 40 years after the discovery of gold in Victoria. Now this one again. And do I say something here? Yes. Well, 6th of March, Roman Social Club. Here we come. Let's have a good night. Well, another one, another experience. Because I was, I was um, you know, visiting the clubs. I wanted to make a presence. That's Fiesta there, the Roman Social Club. And that was the, the hall. Oh, nice set up. Nice set up. And that's whatever. That's a nice plate of pasta there. Uh, and this is Sam here. And the music. The oldies are enjoying themselves. <laughs> Nice good wasn't it uh, it's um you know the, the music and uh, it's it's great to to be able to uh, to go on like that and uh, we'll continue uh, with uh, the next one here there we go here but this time here this one here will be just a picture it'll be one minute there we are so we got the next one there we are
de scaruso fuori. It was a lovely interpretation of, um, you know, of Caruso, uh, but uh, there we are. And then we'll continue. Some people on my table, and uh, he was also one of the sponsors of the club. There they are. I thought they're from Monticello in High Street. And I think I interviewed Monticello. There are. The Continental Cakes and Ice Creams, High Street Thornbury. Nice. Oop, keep going. <laughs> oh, dear. Well, that's what happens with the computer sometimes. goes, you know. Here we go. I interviewed him. Keep going. Come on. Uh, 
I can't believe it. Hold on. I'll get it going first before. I'm joining you from Monticello. You, you're providing the cannoli tonight. Yes. That's wonderful. Well, that's fantastic. Good to meet you tonight. Yeah. Are you are you from Rome? From, from Rome? No, I'm from Sicilia. Ah, Sicilia, then Sicilia. Sicilia a Roma. 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 Sì, yeah. Ok, ci stiamo divertendo stasera, sì. vero? Sì, sì, Ok, bravo, wow, that's it. Adesso te sì. di cannone. Sì, sì. Ok. That was nice, quick and smart. Again. There we are. That was the Presidente. Oh, these are all just photos. I can't believe this. There she is. A bit of an interview. Uh, I'm uh, very pleased to meet you. And thank you very much for tonight. Thank you. And we'll talk later. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, we couldn't talk right away because they're starting to dance. Here we go. <laughs> People saying hello to Sam. There's another picture of us. Uh, I think this is the end now. Yeah? Well, that's it. I think that's the end of it. It's also the end of the program, of course. Yes, yes, was there? Yes, it's the end of the program as well. And uh, it's the end of this program, <laughs> of this live podcast, uh, live presentation, lesson, whatever you want to call it, it's here. Now I'm going to go on. Thank you very much to Carmela Margucci who came in a little bit late and I didn't see you, your name, but uh, you're most welcome to uh, listen to this again uh, because I'm going to go out now and I want to thank you all for coming on and uh, can I say the people are coming on very strongly online uh, you know about 100 people now 80 to 100 uh, coming on each week which is good uh, spread the word uh, these podcasts are for you and for me uh, especially because I'm interested in history and all the other things that I do and promote Italian clubs uh, but you know that's uh, that's what we can do with social media. Uh, it's a fun thing to do, and I encourage you all to do it as well. Okay, on this note, grazie mille, thank you very much uh, for uh, for today, and uh, see you next week. Okay, ciao from Tom Padula of Tom Padula TV on YouTube, and uh, of course, Insegna Booksellers. Ciao.